All right, everyone, welcome. We are here now for the last talk of the day, Anacro PC uh, by James Munns. We are going to have him live really quickly. I will uh, turn on his microphone and camera. We'll read the bio and then we'll get started with the video. So hi, James, let me turn on your camera and microphone. There you are. Hi. Hi there, how are you doing? Hi. I'm doing well, how are you doing? I'm doing well. I'm excited to share my presentation with everyone. Yeah, yeah, we're excited to hear it as well. Um, so I'll go ahead and read about what we'll be doing today, and then we'll start with the video, all right? Sounds great. OK, so here we go, all about James Munns. Uh, his background is developing highly connected and highly reliable embedded systems. Over the past five years or so, he has transitioned to writing nearly all of his embedded systems using Rust. He thinks that being able to share a larger scale project like Anacro PC would be a great way to get more people involved in designing and to build it, excuse me, building embedded systems in Rust. As a member of the Embedded Working Group, Group, as well as a founder of the Ferris Systems. He has spent the last three to four years learning, sharing, and teaching people about Rust and using Rust for embedded systems. He thinks that it would be great to share more about all of the wonderful things that are possible when developing complex systems with Rust. And uh, what we'll do today is we'll learn about Anacro PC, which is an in-process teaching architecture for learning about building complex embedded systems in Rust. It is a simplified version of a PC where every component can be built from commodity microcontrollers. It aims to be fault tolerant and simulation friendly for rapid development. This talk will explore the current status and design choices for an in-development Anacro PC architecture. Anacro PC is a hobbyist teaching architecture with the goal of making it easy for anyone to build their own entire PC system from scratch using low-cost and readily available microcontrollers and development boards. It aims to achieve performance numbers somewhere in the neighborhood of an old 286-386 DOS style PC. This talk will help explain some basics of design complex and distributed hardware systems like those that make up desktop, laptop, and uh, server PC systems that you are all familiar with. From a hardware systems perspective, while from a software perspective, um, he'll explore why Rust is such a perfect choice for designing systems like a Necro PC. This talk will also show a preview of components running in a simulator, as well as the first physical Anacro PC device. Although Anacro PC is designed to be a teaching platform, many of the components, including the high-speed bus arbitrator, uh, communication libraries, simulation tools, and logging infrastructure are all capable of being used for, for productive systems. Uh, in this sense, an Acro PC serves as a useful technology testbed for new and useful embedded bread rust components. Well, wow, that's a mouthful. <laughs> Thank you. All right. Was there anything else you'd like to add before we watch the video? No, I'm I'm going to be in chat and happy to answer any questions. So all right. thanks to everyone for watching. Yeah, thank you all for watching too. And uh, just a quick reminder, I'm sure you're hearing, you're uh, sick of hearing it by now, but uh, please direct the questions to the chat bubble underneath uh, the chat section. There's the main chat and then Q&A. So please keep those there. All right, sit back, relax and enjoy. Hi there, I'm James, and this is Anacro PC, an anachronistic PC architecture. I'm an embedded systems engineer, and I've been working on all kinds of different embedded challenges over the last years. Everything from airplanes to IoT devices to robots to gas detectors. Um, I've also been working for the last two or three years on Rust and embedded systems. Uh, I've been part of the embedded working group to help make Rust one of the best languages for developing embedded systems out there today. Um, I'm also a managing director and embedded engineer at Ferris Systems, um, and we do a lot of Rust stuff, whether it's for clients or for 
teaching or sharing things on open source like we do with our Nerling RS project to build better tools for embedded systems. We're really interested in improving the state of embedded systems and the state of Rust with embedded systems. So one of my favorite things is making computers talk to each other, particularly little embedded systems, which aren't always the easiest thing to get to talk to each other. I personally think embedded systems are a ton of fun. Ever since the first day in university where I sat down and they put uh, a microcontroller with some LEDs and a motor on it in front of me, and I saw the motor spin because of something I coded, uh, I knew I was pretty much hooked then. I think Rust makes it easier for computers to work together. Uh, as a language, I really enjoy using Rust because it makes it so easy to get all kinds of different things, whether it's different threads or different programs or even things on different computers to work together. And I think, I think this applies to embedded systems too. I also think that Rust makes it easier to work with computers. We can do some really powerful things with the Rust language that help us as embedded systems engineers model the hardware we're working on and make sure we don't make any silly mistakes while interacting with that hardware. I have a sneaking suspicion that I think Rust could also make it easier to build computers, not just build software on top of computers, but to build the lowest level of software and really build something that we think of as its own computer. Now, I've always wanted to build my own computer. I've built a lot of standalone electronic systems uh, that you could probably call a computer, but I've always wanted a computer that I could sit in front of, that I could say, I built everything there, and it is a full computer that I built from scratch. So I decided to. Uh, luckily, I got invited to uh, speak at Rust Lab, and a couple months before that, I had written down some notes of what I think a computer written in Rust could look like. And now that I had inspiration and a deadline, that's pretty much the way that I get things done. So this is kind of the, the combination of those two things all coming together. But I didn't just want this computer to be for me. I spent a lot of time with the embedded working group and teaching and things like that, making embedded systems easier for everyone to get into and for Rust as a language to be as easy as possible for people to take their first step with it. Because honestly, I like working with people too. Computers are a really fun challenge, but getting people together and working on something collaboratively is something that's just way more fun than being a standalone project for me. So I wanted to figure out a way that I could make this computer something that more than just I could work on. But what if anyone could build their own computer? How could I, with the things that I'm building, empower them? How could I share my experience and set a good environment where people can have those great successes really quickly? Well, there are some ways to come up with good ideas about that. Um, and I decided to look back in the past and present of the kind of systems that I've been working on and I've worked on through the years and, and figure out what really inspires me. Where can I draw inspiration from? Where could I get that good inspiration from? Well, I could start by looking at the past. I could look at all the systems that have inspired me through the years and figure out what I liked about them to figure out how I can kind of ignite that spark in the project that I'm working on right now. So this is a, a special computer for me. This is the IBM PC XT. And this is the first computer that I really feel like was mine. Um, this was a hand-me-down computer from my parents who also needed a computer for work at the time and eventually when this computer got a little too old for what they were trying to do, uh, this became the, the family computer. And this is the first computer that I really remember spending late nights in front of trying to figure out how it worked and really being inspired by what it was and what I could do with it. Playing text adventure games or figuring out just how the computer worked and clicking the really loud keyboard all of the time. This is the computer that I really keep going back to in terms of what inspired me to want to be able to play with computers. Now, 
this computer was inspiring at the time, but if you look at the specs now, it's not super inspiring. It's something like 5 megahertz CPU, about a half a mega RAM, 10 megabyte hard drive, some expansion slots if you had some expensive cards you wanted to plug into it. But for 1983, this was a pretty cool computer. And even when I was playing with it way later in the 80s and into the early 90s, it was still a really cool special computer for me. And it really proved to me that you can make a lot of computer with not a lot of power. This was a real computer to me. You could sit there and type documents. And if I had been able to program at the time, you probably, or I definitely could have programmed on it. Um, and I think that you don't need a lot of computer power to still be an inspiring kind of platform. So there are people who are still working with computers like this today. Uh, a couple groups come to mind. One is the retro computer scene, the people who are doing all the preservation work to keep these kind of computers alive, as well as the demo scene, who are still pushing these computers to their limit year after year, competing to see who can make the best video and audio demo using these computers from the 80s and 90s. Now, when I talk about the demo scene, I'm usually talking about computers like this, like the Amiga and the Commodore 64. And these are systems that people are still building the software for today, whether it's standalone games or just really impressive AV demos. Uh, I really have a lot of respect for the people who work in the demo scene because they're just impressive on how much they can take these computers that we think we know everything about and they can figure out how to get them just a little bit faster. The problem with these computers is they get old. I mean, whether someone stored them without taking a battery out or whether the capacitors just died and leaked gunk all over the motherboard and started corroding the components or whether the chips just finally after 30 years gave up the ghost. Uh, eventually, these computers come to some kind of end in one way or another. But the cool thing about them being still things that people really like using and with how much further we've come along with the ability to make circuit boards and use components and how fast modern components have gotten this whole cottage industry of people retrofitting their computers whether it's to repair pieces that have broken or whether it's to extend it to do things like it was never designed to do like adding wi-fi to a commodore 64 these are all things that are possible today due to how far we've come and this is something that really speaks out to me because Extending something past its original design life and design intent is something that's really, really inspiring for me. So what kind of inspiration can I get from the present? What kind of things can I look around and say, okay, these are people who are doing something that's interesting and I can take a flavor of that into my project. Well, JP has had this project called the Monotron and now even the second generation, the Neotron for a number of years and has talked about it a lot. And it's been amazing what he's been able to pack into a single microcontroller. So the Monotron is one ARM Cortex-M microcontroller that is an entire computer. He's got an operating system, a BIOS. He runs video directly from the CPU with software rendering. And it's astounding the kind of demos and games and programs he's been able to get running on the Monotron. And if nothing else, he's really proved that you can build a computer out of the Rust programming language and microcontrollers. So I think that idea has definitely been proven out. So hopefully at least what I'm trying to do is definitely possible. But the challenge with the approach that the Monotron takes is that it takes a lot of effort to get so much functionality into one single package. And for some people like the demo scene minded folks, this is part of the fun. It means that you have to figure out how to fit all of those responsibilities into the very limited set of resources that you have. But maybe that's not necessarily the experience I want. Maybe the experience I want is that people can focus on just the one piece that really inspires them. Maybe they want to have a computer, but they want to have a computer so that they can build their own MIDI sequencer on it. Or maybe they want to control motors. Or maybe they want to do both. Maybe they want a MIDI-controlled motor. Why shouldn't they be able to build a computer themselves and just focus on the parts that are really interesting to them? So... How can I break the concept of a computer into bite-sized pieces? Well, luckily for me, your computer already is bite-sized pieces, but you may not think of it that way. The computer that you sit in front of, whether that's a phone or a tablet or a PC or a laptop, is already made up a bunch of 
way smaller computers. And that's not even a metaphor or hyperbole. Your hard drive is its own computer. It's got a CPU, it's got RAM, your graphics card's the same, your network card's the same. But when we put them all together in one box, they start acting like what you think of as a computer, which is pretty inspiring if you think about it. So pretty much every desktop or laptop PC in the last 20 years or so has followed an architecture that looks sort of like this. You have the CPU, which is your AMD or Intel or nowadays ARM CPU, which is connected to RAM and high-speed buses like PCI Express using a component called the North Bridge. This North Bridge job is to make all of these three components play nice with each other. And even to get these three components playing nice with each other and slower components like regular PCI, USB, or your legacy hard drives and BIOS. This is, you know, the job of this North Bridge to get all of these components working together so that it feels like one cohesive computer. So I'm a very systems engineering kind of person, and that for me means writing down requirements and drawing block diagrams. So if I was thinking about an Acro PC, what kind of requirements would I put on that and what kind of block diagrams would I draw? Well, for this PC that I want, I want to be able to use only cheap, off-the-shelf, widely available parts. I want everyone to be able to use either the stuff they already have on their shelf or in a drawer if they bought some components at some point, or if they're just looking to get started, stuff that they can buy off the shelf for pretty cheap today. I want to only use common and simple protocols. So things like USB and Ethernet are great, but the cheap chips don't have that in it. So I want to only use components and capabilities that the cheapest of chips will have, because that kind of widens my area of what could be possible and how people can get started. I want this system to be really robust and tolerant to failure because if people are building something from scratch or they're just getting started in their learning, I don't want their first experience to be a blue screen of death on their Anacro PC. I want them to really, even if they make mistakes, kind of like the Rust compiler, I want them to get helpful diagnostics that say, oops, your keyboard stopped talking to me. And now it's doing it, but it's not doing it reliably. Maybe you want to check on that. You probably need to fix something. I want there to be a short path to success for newcomers. If you're brand new to embedded systems, I want you to be able to get that first success in a day, not after a month of assembling kits and components and wondering how DMA works. I want you to be able to sit down and build the one thing that you really care about so that you can get that success immediately because that's such a positive feedback loop. I really want to focus on simplicity over perfection. I could make probably a faster computer or a more performant or a more reliable computer, but I want simplicity to be kind of the guiding light here. I think if we set the foundation of simple and understandable, people will start growing from there organically. And I don't have to worry about getting everything right today because everything is going to be right a little bit differently for different people. I also know people are going to be using different chips. Everyone has preferences, or if they don't, they're going to be preferring whatever's cheapest today. And that means there's going to be a lot of different components in play, whether that's an STM32 or an NRF52 or an Atmega. I want people to be able to plug whatever they want and get a computer out of the other side. I also want an Acro to be really fun to work on. I mean, this is a hobby project for me, and I imagine for most people, it's also going to be a hobby project. So it's got to keep me coming back, and it's got to keep other people interested in coming back as well. Now, my one kind of minimum floor here is I want a Nacro to be at least as performant as that IBM PCXT. For me, that's the minimum bar of what I'm ready to call a computer that I want to play with day to day. I have to be able to, you know, edit some text and maybe browse the web and maybe someday browse Twitter. So JP put the right words in my head when I described all these things I was trying to do. And he said, you're trying to build Minix for motherboards. So Minix was the operating system that kind of came between Unix and Linux. Minix was a teaching operating system that people used to learn about things so that they could get used to Unix. And it was one of the inspirations for the Linux kernel itself. And if an acro is something like that for people building their own computers, then I'd love for it to be that. So this is the architecture that I came up with. And 
there is a lot going on here, so don't worry about getting it all in one take. And I'm going to come back to this picture a couple times. But the first important part is that I've got this arbitrator sitting in the middle. And this arbitrator is what glues all of the other components together, kind of like the north bridge from that old diagram or the, the diagram of your current computer system. So with the arbitrator, I want to try and get all the hard stuff out of the way. So if you're building something cool, you're probably going to want to plug some brand new fancy component that you wrote into your computer and you want it to work. So I want to offload all of the complex and complicated things off of everyone who's building their own cards that address their own needs and move it into the arbitrator so that it should just work and you don't have to think about how it works, at least not on day one. I think most people will get there eventually, but I don't want it to be something that gets in their way to start with. So this arbitrator is in charge of coordinating between all of these devices. And I call each of these devices cards because I'm coming back to that, that IBM PCXT, which was a big box with a bunch of expansion cards in it. And you notice that I actually put the CPU on the same level as all of these cards because in my design, the CPU actually doesn't have anything special about it. It's talking to the arbitrator, and the arbitrator's job is to connect all these other devices together, which means everyone's on sort of a level playing foot. Or, if you wanted to make a dual-core system, that works too. Just put another CPU on the bus. So, I chose the SPI, or SPI, or Serial Peripheral Interface Protocol, for a couple reasons. One, it's fast, or at least relatively fast. For most microcontrollers, SPI is generally the fastest peripheral they have because they use it for all kinds of things, whether it's loading code or storing external memory or talking to a display. Most microcontrollers have a relatively fast SPI port because they need it for a bunch of different stuff. It's also available. It's one of the most common protocols, and almost every microcontroller that you can buy today, or even microcontrollers from 5 or 10 years ago, are going to have some kind of support for the SPI protocol. It's also a fairly simple and reliable protocol. Uh, it works by every time you clock one clock cycle, you shift one byte in and one byte, or one bit in and one bit out, which means it works fairly directly, and the code to control it is pretty straightforward. Um, there's not a lot to go wrong. There are some other fancier buses that do exist pretty commonly, but most of them are either not as fast as SPI or not as reliable in that they can sometimes get locked up, and you might have to do kind of a complicated dance to get the, your device unlocked up. So SPI seemed like the right choice for Anacro, at least to start with. So normally when you use SPI, you have what's called an SPI controller in the center. And that might be your microcontroller talking to a display and a RAM chip and an SD card or something like that. And that works out really well because your microcontroller, which is running the software, is also running the show when it comes to SPI. It says, I'm talking to you. Thank you. We're done. I'm talking to you. Thank you. We're done. Um, but what I've done is actually kind of turn that's on its head. Um, I mentioned before about wanting to move all the hard stuff into the arbitrator, and it turns out it's a bit more complicated to write software for an SPI peripheral than it is for an SPI controller, because a controller runs the show. And if you're writing software that has to respond to when someone else is running the show, that can be a bit more challenging to get right. Um, so I flipped that on its head, and I've said the arbitrator is the peripheral, and every single card is a controller. This is great because it means they can all run the show in however they're used to running the show, whether that's slow or fast or however they need to run it. You can write a blocking controller or a non-blocking interrupt or event-driven or async await controller, and it doesn't matter because the peripheral is handling it all. The one thing I'm adding in there is what I call a go signal for each one. And this is basically the arbitrator saying, I'm paying attention to you, and I'm paying attention to you. And when the arbitrator is not paying attention to one of these cards, it basically hangs up the phone on that. So it doesn't matter if the card keeps talking even though it's not its turn, the arbitrator is not going to hear it because it hung up on you. And this is great for reliability. I also want people to focus more on a sort of network-driven orientation rather than a more operating system or embedded systems classical way. And what I mean by that is 
you should think about these as independent systems sending requests and responses to each other. A lot like RPC if you're used to backend systems. And not thinking about shared memory or how do I call the kernel or how do I talk to the kernel. Just send a message to something. And once you send a message, you'll get a message back. And you can build an entire system around that. And you don't have to think quite as hard about that. And Hopefully this should be more friendly to folks coming from non-embedded backgrounds. And for the embedded folks, they're probably comfortable with some kind of communication like this. So I think this is a great place to start, particularly when we have our distributed system anyway, which has to talk over the wire. So let's make a future retro computer. What does it take to make a future retro computer? Well, I want to introduce the first one. This is the first and hopefully not the last Anacro PC the Anacro Stargazer. So here it is in all of its hands soldered together and wires hanging out everywhere kind of glory. But this is really what I'm ready to say is a first standalone computer. It's got all the things that I mentioned before. It's got the arbitrator. So I'm using an Adafruit Featherboard, which is a really common microcontroller that has the Nordic NRF52 on it. Uh, I use this one because I really like it, and I use it in a bunch of different projects, so I use it because I'm familiar with it, and that's kind of the whole idea of an Acro. So it's got those yellow wires coming out to the bus that let it decide whose turn it is to talk and to communicate over the those SPI lines. I also have a programming header so I can flash new code to it whenever I want. The next part is the CPU. Now, it's that same Adafruit NRF52 because, like I said, I like it. And it was easier to write the same code for a bunch of different chips than to write different code for all the different chips. And I was kind of on a deadline here, so it made sense to me. The extra chip you see on there is basically how I implement that hang-up mechanism. So when the arbitrator isn't saying, hey, CPU, it's your turn to talk. That chip basically says, oh, it's not our turn. And it disconnects all the wire. So even if the CPU is not being a good citizen, no one else on the bus can tell. And again, it's wired up to these bus pins so it can talk to all the other devices in our system. I also fairly critically built a debugging header. And what this does is it connects to all those debugging headers on every single one of the cards so I can program all of it at the same time. Also over on the left, you'll see a keyboard header because what would a computer be without its own standalone keyboard? Now, there's no graphics card for microcontrollers that I'm aware of, but it turns out the cheapest board that I could get that had HDMI on it so I can plug it into a monitor that I have was a Raspberry Pi Zero. So I got a Raspberry Pi Zero. So kind of like that original description I gave you, my graphics card runs Linux too, and it talks to all the other components on the bus so you can draw things over HDMI. I think this is sort of upside down and hilarious, but it's future retro, so I'm going with it. So this is that bus, and we can see that our bus has eight slots in it, and I can use those slots for anything. I can use them for CPUs, I can use them for the arbitrator, I can use them for the Raspberry Pi graphics card. Basically, all of these slots are parallel horizontally, so when you plug something into the top pin of each row, they're all connected. And this is great because it makes it really easy for me to wire them all together. You can also see I've wired up a USB-C power delivery uh, power supply rather than a barrel jack because we're living in the future now and USB-C should be on all devices. So this is the keyboard. So this is a kit called the Maker Diary M60, which is also running an NRF52 on the back of the keyboard, but it's a full keyboard with buttons and LEDs, and it's gonna serve as the keyboard for my Anacro PC retro computer. And it's also got that clicky keyboard feel that I missed from my IBM PC XT, even though I'm not a big mechanical keyboard person. And this is connected up to that uh, keyboard header on my debug header because it's got sort of a different wire kind of pinout, but it lets me talk to the rest of the system, and it's just another part of the PC ecosystem. So, time for a demo. So I get to show off what this Anacro PC looks like today, and what's already possible. All right, we've got our Anacro PC sitting here on screen now. So we've got all of the four cards plugged into the back plane. And we've also got some debuggers and a serial port plugged into my USB hub hiding underneath there. And we've got a, a keyboard sitting in front of me as well. So I'm going to bring up the screen so we can see what's going on here. 
Uh, I've got four windows here, one for each card. I've got my arbitrator, my CPU, my keyboard, and the Raspberry Pi. So let's go ahead and launch the software on my arbitrator. So I'm gonna go ahead and program it and also get ready to program my CPU. So we see now the arbitrator is sort of complaining because no one's talking to it right now. So let's, uh, let's let it talk to the CPU and the CPU is gonna power on and it's gonna negotiate a connection and it went ahead and connected, which is great. So let's also get our uh, keyboard involved and let's launch our Raspberry Pi as well. So we see both our keyboard and the Raspberry Pi have connected. And if I bring up the screen a bit and I start typing, you can see the keyboard lights up with keys. I've got all kinds of rainbow LEDs in here. And you can see some of those windows moving with me typing. Um, and what's actually happening is the keyboard is sending messages over this connector. It's going into the arbitrator. The arbitrator is talking to the CPU and the CPU is talking to the display over here, rendering the characters out. So if I take this all the way full screen again, we can see uh, if I na navigate around my keyboard, I can say, hello, Rust Lab. And I don't have shift working. So it's one, one, one. Just pretend that I'm really, really, really excited. But yeah, this is a, a full communication. And every time I type, you can see um, all of the devices on the bus hearing the different messages and processing them. And the display is the one that actually processes it and uh, manages it. So this is a full working computer. There's not a lot to it right now, but it's got all the uh, structure. I think I need to start building some really cool things around it. Okay, let's talk about what I actually built for an acro along the way. So when I realized we were going to have a bunch of components that needed to talk to each other, I realized it was going to need some kind of network stack. I mean, the devices have to send messages back to each other, and that, that smells a lot like a network stack. So I didn't set out to build a seven-layer model. Uh, I promise I didn't look at the OSI model before I started building this, but it sort of shook into this direction. And going from the top where we've got user applications all the way down to the bottom at the wire, this was actually just a great way to organize it. You can also notice there's sort of a pattern in each of these layers. I've, I've marked what it is in Rust. So the lowest layer is actually implemented as a struct, which means I've got specific logic in there. And the next layer up is a trait. And this lets me do some really powerful things in terms of being able to run on different platforms and run on different protocols. So I said before that Rust makes building computers easier, but I didn't really elaborate on that. But it turns out that when you're building a network protocol all the way down to the lowest levels of interacting with the hardware, Rust and its capabilities are actually pretty amazing here. So. I was able to put all my business logic, the protocol, state machines, and deciding, am I connected, am I not connected, am I waiting for a message, have I timed out? I can put those all in structs because I've got data and I've got functions right next to each other, and it really makes sense for that. And when I've got interfaces, like how do I talk to the hardware here, I actually can abstract those all away using traits, which means that I don't have to worry concretely about how it works, I just have to tell the implementers how I want it done. And I can express that through traits, which is pretty cool. So when I'm talking about traits, I'm talking about something like this that comes from the card SPI low level layer. Um, and these are all just fundamental building blocks of what it means to talk over an SPI connection. I have to be able to process messages that came in. I have to say, hey, I'd like to talk or hey, is it my turn to talk? Or here's uh, some data, begin. Or am I done sending that data? Where these are all kind of abstract concepts that doesn't matter what kind of hardware you're running on. It's just how the SPI hardware is going to work, regardless of what chip you're on. And then I can take that trait and I can say, OK, my high level structure can take any low level implementer because all I need to do is process the data in the way it needs to make sense. So whenever I'm pulling my high level abstraction, all I have to do is process my low level data, 
ask my low level data, is the exchange still going on? And it can do whatever is necessary for whatever hardware you're running on to decide whether it is or isn't still busy, which means I can keep this separation really, really clear, which helps a lot for network protocols and doubly helps so when you're trying to make portable hardware code. So it means that you can only replace the bits that you need to. So in practice, this means you have to write way fewer drivers, or at least way fewer parts of drivers, and you could spend way more time focusing on the fun stuff, like a MIDI keyboard that claps its hands at the same time. So when I'm talking about this portability, here's an example of using the same SPI communication on two different chips. If you notice, the stack's exactly the same all the way down, because you don't change any code. The only place where you need to change code, depending on whether you're running on an NRF52 or an STM32, is the very lowest layer where you're actually interacting with the low-level hardware. And that's it. Once you re-implement that one tiny layer that's like those seven functions that I showed you, your entire stack now works on new hardware, which means porting it to whatever your favorite flavor of microcontroller is should be a way easier process. And it turns out this process even scales. If you want to do something like, hey, I don't like SPI, I need UART, like I did with my keyboard when I wanted to use my keyboard, but it didn't have enough pins broken out on the keyboard kit for me to actually use SPI, so I had to use UART. The only things that I had to implement there were the UART parts. And once I figured out how to wire that into the card and arbitrator uh, interfaces, which are basically just send message, receive message, all of a sudden it works perfectly well with UART. This was a process that took like an hour. And that was for implementing all three parts of that. And I don't think it's going to be significantly worse for different protocols or different pieces of hardware, which makes me really excited for all the different platforms we can support super quickly here. And hopefully not duplicating code and just get the business logic right in one place and then just worry about portability concerns. So putting my money where my mouth is, I've already ported the Anacro protocol to four different kinds of uh, communication protocols. So I've talked about SPY and UART. Um, I've also made it work over TCP. So when I was originally testing this, I did it over a TCP socket just because it was easier to test there. And once I realized that I had my business logic right, I could actually go work on the hardware. I've also gotten it working over a wireless protocol called ESB, which the Nordic chips use. I have my whole home wireless network already using the Anacro protocol because it was easier to just reuse the Anacro protocol than come up with something fancy just for the wireless network. I really do mean it that putting this on new hardware or new communication protocols should take like minutes to hours depending on how different they are from what we've done already. I also want to mention that there's a couple other superpowers we have here when we're working with hardware. I've talked about traits and how they can help abstract away from hardware differences. But things like Serde, which is a framework in Rust for serializing and deserializing data, uh, is really powerful because you can spend more time thinking about Rust structures rather than binary bits or bytes on the wire. Um, you've probably used Serde for things like JSON or TOML or YAML before, but there are versions like Postcard, which I've written, which also work perfectly well on microcontrollers and actually are a really efficient binary protocol, which means they're great for sending over relatively slow buses like a UART or sometimes even a packet radio. Now, when I say it's a superpower, it, it's because I never had to sit down and think about what is my wire protocol going to look like? And I never had to write fragile code that took bits and bytes from specific places. I just said, hey, this is a Rust struct, and I'm going to send the Rust struct from here to there. And I didn't have to think about how that was going to happen. Well, I did, but like a year ago when I wrote Postcard. When I was writing an acro, I just put derive, serialize, deserialize on my messages. Cool, we got a wire protocol now. And I didn't have to think about it at all, which means you're thinking in Rust more and less about reading a PDF or a text document that explains how all of these bits are supposed to sit on the wire. This doesn't just apply to the lower level code in an acro, though. It also applies to your application code in an acro. So this is an example of the wire protocol that I used at the application layer for that demo you just saw. I had a key press structure, which just says, oh, you pressed a key, here's a character. Or when I wanted to draw a color, I could just send a red, green, and a blue value. 
and all I had to do was slap serialize and deserialize on it, and all of a sudden, it's a representation on the wire, and I don't have to think about it. I've also provided a little macro that helps glue this all together when you're saying, I want to send as this device, so as a keyboard, I want to be able to listen to messages like this and send messages to this. And this is a nice way where you can just say, this is how I'm defining my protocol in Rust, not in a PDF. And this doesn't just have to live in your application. You can put this types and the table definitions in a struct or excuse me, in a crate that you can share between a bunch of different devices. So getting all the versions right can be as simple as making sure everyone has the same version or the same Semver compatible version of these interfaces. And you don't have to think about it as a protocol writer because that's not what brings most people joy. I mean, I enjoy working with it, but I don't think it's for everyone. At least most people don't enjoy it. You can also use traits for abstracting over more kinds of hardware. So I talked about network and communication hardware, but where else can we abstract over hardware? Well, there's this great project in the Rust embedded space called Embedded Graphics, and it's doing these same kinds of universal abstractions for things like displays. You can take on one side an e-paper display, an LCD, or an OLED, and on the other side you can say, I've got circles and triangles and text. And you don't have to worry about how to connect all of these different things together. You just say, I have drawable items. Please give them to something that knows how to draw them. And it bridges the gap where you stop having to think about all these implementation details and you just get to think about what you want to do instead of how you want to do it. I think we can take this one step further with an Acro PC. What if instead of drawing to a display, you were drawing to the network and you could talk over the network to, instead of drawing all of these pixels on your CPU, which may not have much power, you can just say, dear graphics card, I have these 10 triangles, these five circles and two lines, please draw them in red for me. And that means that you're not sending a lot of data over the wire and your CPU isn't doing all of that rendering. You can just render shapes. And this is actually a lot of how modern graphics libraries work, like OpenGL or Vulkan. They say, hey, graphics card, here's a bunch of stuff, or here's a bunch of shaders, or I want water here. And your graphics card just does it for you because it's way better at doing those kind of things. And it keeps the load off of your CPU. I think we can do some really magical things by exposing a trait to your CPU have that transparently used Serde behind the scenes, serialize all those triangles and circles and lines over the network, and the graphics card can receive those and say, okay, I can draw those. I think we could do some really powerful things here, and I'm really excited to see what other kind of interfaces, whether that's for audio or anything that you would want your computer to do. If we could do that over the wire and someone writing the code doesn't even know that they're sending messages, it just feels like you're interacting with any other function in Rust. So where do we go from here? So that was an admittedly f limited demo, but it's got all the foundational work to really build an impressive or at least interesting computer for me at least. But what should we do next? Well, I think it's probably time to start tackling the more than one developer problems. This is uh, addressing things like using versions of software that only I know about, or not documenting all the things that are going on, or oops, I know that I wired a couple extra wires here to make it work because I realized after I wrote the schematics that I found some problems. So to address that, at least from a software perspective, uh, I think we need to do something for message stability. I want people to be able to plug in old versions of cards and have them still work even if you've changed the version of software. Now, Saturday and Postcard doesn't give that to you out of the box, but there's definitely some strategies we can use and we can decide to use at the anacro level that says, yeah, you're using something that's either backwards compatible or nope, you have no idea how to process that message. So, sorry. Um, I'd also love to not have my eight debuggers plugged in at the same time. Luckily, I've got a good USB hub, but I don't think everyone should have to do that. I'd love to write some kind of standard bootloader so you can just load the firmware for your entire device at boot time and all your systems just work. I'd also have, love to have some kind of 
BIOS or enumeration process where when your CPU powers on, it goes, cool, what do I have? Oh, I've got two graphics card, an audio card, and a hard drive. Cool, I can work with that. Rather than having to, like it is right now, know that it just has one keyboard, one display, and an arbitrator working with it. I think this will let you do things, maybe not like hot plug, but you could at least power the system off, put two new cards in, boot it up, and all of a sudden now you have displays on two graphics cards instead of one. I would love to build or help someone build an operating system on top of this. I think it's such an interesting, different architecture where it's really designed more like a fleet than a single piece of hardware. And I'd love to see the kind of impressive systems people can build on top of this. And I'd love to have someone who didn't think that they could build an operating system because they say, oh, I manage a fleet of backend systems. I don't know how to write an operating system. Well, maybe this operating system could be a lot more like that fleet of backend systems because that's the kind of operating system this system needs. And I'd love to see people build some really cool applications. So I talked about that MIDI keyboard that claps or, you know, a robot that's dancing around using an acro as the engine behind the scenes. If you would love to build something and you just need the hardware and the inspiration, come reach out to me. I'd love to see what you could build with an acro. Now, I learned a lot from making the first hardware. And you should read that in a particular way in that there's probably some room for improvement. Um, the components that I've used made sense for prototyping, especially with things like the bus backplane. Um, it's a wonderful Z80 kit that I got from a, a Tindy store where they're building this backplane so people can build kits of Z80s. So I felt, you know, that's like an old computer. I want a retro future computer. Let's, let's put a backplane in my system. But for what Anacro needs and for how it works, it's maybe not exactly what I want. Um, also, these cards were kind of a pain to hand solder and they're simple enough I really should have just gone on the internet and designed a really cheap simple circuit board for it. So what should we be focusing on after the first revision of hardware after this post stargazer world? Well from a hardware perspective I need to actually implement that system memory because I ran out of time before I was able to do it but I have the hardware for it and I've got the fundamentals now so I'd love to start building on this memory allocator so you can have even low power systems have access to way bigger chunks of memory so that they can do things like fill up a message and send it to a graphics card. I'd also love to have some better hardware design um, whether that means that I'm doing the hardware design or I can talk to someone who's interested in less software, but more hardware, and really wants to build some simple breakout boards and things like that. Eventually, I'd love to have a kit, whether that means just a standard socket that you could plug any Adafruit feather or anything compatible with a feather into it. And instead of having to hand wire up stuff for about a week like I did, you can just either order the kits pre-assembled or you can assemble them yourself and just have to do some straightforward soldering and choose the development board of your choice. I'd also love this to be accessible for all kinds of people. So these feathers are wonderful dev boards. They're very robust, but they cost anywhere from like 15 to 25 bucks a piece. And that's fine for one dev board. But if you're buying eight of them, that adds up pretty quickly. But there's all kinds of cheap hardware available now on all kinds of hobbyist sites from Adafruit to SparkFun to eBay to AliExpress. And there's great microcontrollers that are available for a buck, sometimes even less. So I'd love to make kits and boards that let you use feathers for some cards and maybe six really cheap cards until you figure out exactly what you want to be doing with that. Um, this is also somewhere where I'd love to have help. So if you're interested in building some hardware, even really straightforward kind of breakout board style things, nothing fancy surface mount, just through whole hand solderable components, Come talk to me. I've had a couple people reach out already, and I'd love to collaborate with a bunch of people to be able to get this all in one place. I have a sneaking suspicion that Anacro is going to be useful for a lot more than retro future computers. I spent a lot of time building systems over the years, and all of these systems typically have something in common in that it was kind of a pain in the butt to get the different components to talk to each other, at least for systems that had more than one CPU involved. And that more than one CPU could be a wireless gateway. It could be the embedded Linux system talking to a couple of low power microcontrollers. And it turns out these problems kind of repeat themselves all over the embedded industry, not just building your own retro future computer. 
And it turns out I've kind of build, been building an acro as this kit of tools that I wish I would had for almost every single project I've ever worked on that involved more than one CPU or component in a system. And I really want an acro to be this go-to toolkit that I can use, kind of like the wireless system at home, where it's just easier to use an acro and improve an acro than it is to build something bespoke for each and every project. I really think that embedded developers can learn from all kinds of different folks, whether that's web developers, DevOps, Dev, DevOps, DevOps folks, or front-end developers, because I think Embedded developers have been very stubborn about learning new things, and I see that changing with the folks that I'm seeing in being involved with embedded Rust today, and that gives me a lot of hope. I think Rust has a lot of opportunity for cross-pollinating ideas between these different industries, and I think an Acro PC could hopefully be one of those areas. So we can't play exactly the game because we are still constrained by code size and speed and capabilities, but that doesn't mean we can't shake things up. Why couldn't you have a Docker file that takes binary images, puts them on a, uh, an SD card, and flashes your device every time it boots so you can have this kind of reliable, hand-dedicated system that works in the way that you can specify in code? These are things that would blow your mind when you're building embedded systems, but... These are the things that backend developers have been doing for years already. I really want an acro to make it painless to wrangle a fleet of any kind of computers, big and small, working together on a single dedicated bigger application. Whether that bigger application is an IBM PCA XT style computer that I can put on my desk in front of me and run a markdown editor in, or whether it's a robot or whether it's a remote controlled car, or whether it's a music making device, or maybe it's a plug-in system for a modular synth, or maybe it's a whole modular synth. I'd love to see what people could do to stop focusing on all the building blocks and start focusing on the actual problems that they want to solve. Because I think bite-sized pieces are just as good for professional projects as they are for hobbyists and students. I see this all over the place, so where a lot of the times it would be way easier to throw five chips at a problem rather than to throw one chip that's got to do five different things. And especially as chips get cheaper and especially as there are more and more uh, capabilities with things like RISC-V or even just low-cost ARM chips, I really think we can change the math on how can we deliver projects quickly when we have all the building blocks already there with Rust and a framework like Anacro. So if you're interested in contributing, I've gone ahead and bought the wonderful domain anacro.computer. So this will point to some kind of landing page. I'm recording this ahead of when you're watching this, but by the time you're watching this, that will be a link that goes to some kind of landing page. Uh, or just come check out my GitHub repo. Uh, check out the issues, and I'll also hopefully be writing a lot of documentation between the time of recording this presentation and you seeing this presentation. So come check it out. I'll have issues and things like that for the software, the hardware, linked to docs, and I'd love to see you work with me on this. And if you have a problem, either in your hobby projects or in your professional projects that you think an acro or that I could help you with, feel free to reach out. I love talking to people and I'd love to see what an acro could do and see all the areas where people think that an acro might be the right solution for them. So send me an email. So thanks to everyone for watching this talk on an acro PC. Uh, I'm James Munns on BitShift Mask on Twitter and uh, thank you all and have a great rest of the week. All right, everyone, welcome back. Hopefully the second half uh, didn't give anyone problems there and uh, we're ready to go live with James Munns now to answer some of your questions. So let me go ahead and turn on webcam. Hi there, James. Hi there. Hi, so thank you so much for your contribution for Rust Lab. Uh, we're really happy to have you here, even if it's uh, been a little buggy today. <laughs> Thanks for, for being here. Yeah, no problem. Um, do you have anything you wanted to say about your participation in Rust Lab or anything no, to add? It's been, no, it's been really great to uh, to work on this. And uh, the, like I said, the deadline was healthy in terms of uh, actually getting something done. But uh, I'm really excited to keep working on this. And since, uh, since I recorded the presentation, I've been looking at hardware and how I can make it easier for people to get some of uh, these Anacro PC items in their own hands so they can start working on it. So definitely, if anyone's interested, I'm, I'm super happy to help people get started. 
Awesome. Thanks for that. And uh, we had a question you answered already in chat, which is what is the status of Rust for a critical embedded system? Is there any progress? Um, did you want to add anything to your answer that you put earlier? Yeah, definitely. So uh, my background's actually, as I mentioned, in avionics and a couple other safety critical areas. And I really want to get back into using Rust in those industries. So my company, Ferris Systems, has been working on a project called Sealed Rust, which is getting Rust ready for safety critical systems like automotive or avionics or robotics or things like that. And we kicked off the technical work starting in September of this year. So if you're interested in it, um, I gave a keynote at Oxidize Conf where I kind of gave an update of the status. Um, and if you're uh, in an industry that's safety critical and you're interested in using Ross, definitely feel free to reach out to me. I'm more than happy to chat with people. Awesome. Thanks for that. Uh, we had another question from Jonathan. Do the Rust bits use abort on panic? Yeah, so uh, panic in embedded is a little bit different than on your desktop since uh, normally when you when you panic on your desktop, your operating system says, oh, great, and it stops the program and it, it handles that for you. But on an embedded system, there's not always one right strategy, whether you want your computer to stop doing what it's doing or reboot and try to recover from it. Um, so typically, Rust crates will use panic abort, um, but you will provide your own panic handler. Um, so there's all kinds of different crates out there on crates.io. Uh, most of them start with panic dash something. Um, but there's all kinds of built-in behavior like panic reset if you want your device to just immediately reboot and try again, or panic halt if you want your program to stop, or I've written one called uh, panic persist, which will actually write the panic message into uh, some RAM storage, then reboot, so that when you reboot, you can kind of grab whatever that panic message was and write it to a log or uh, respond to that behavior some way. So. It's one of those things where embedded systems, there's there's very rarely one right answer. Uh, and what the right thing is, is usually different. So we've exposed that in Rust by letting you define your own panic handler. But usually that's just as simple as picking which crate you want to use in your project. Awesome. Thank you for that. Um, I don't see any other questions. Does anyone else have anything? I think the presentation was very clear. So hopefully that means that uh, they didn't have any other questions to say. Yeah, uh, and I know uh, hardware is something that's new for a lot of people. So it's it's hard to get started and there's a lot of concepts out there, but that's definitely one of the things that I'm hoping to do with an Acro computer is to let people sit in a more computer-like environment and slowly learn parts of embedded. So uh, definitely I'm hoping to have a lot of people from a lot of different backgrounds, especially people who would say, oh, you know, embedded systems isn't something that I've thought I could get into before. So definitely I'm hoping uh, lots of people, this is a good entry point for a lot of people to come from different backgrounds and learn about embedded systems because I think they're a ton of fun. Yeah, it seems super interesting. Awesome. Well, thank you for that. Um, okay, someone says embedded underrated. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it's been it's been challenging and hard to work on before. And I think Rust has some really great opportunities to uh, to change that because it doesn't have to be hard. No, no, definitely not. All right. Well, awesome. I think uh, we're just about done here. So um, I want to say thank you, James Munns, for coming. And of course, everyone else for uh, being patient with all the hiccups we had today. Uh, hopefully, we'll see you in our next edition of Rest Lab 2, whether it be in person or virtual again like this one. Great. Thanks for having me. Yeah, thanks. Enjoy the rest of your day, James. <laughs> you too. Bye. Thanks. Thanks. Bye-bye. All right, you guys, that concludes the third day of Rust. I just want to, Rust Lab, I just want to remind you all that uh, if you like the talk, you can definitely go to the agenda page on the Rust Lab site and give it a rating. Uh, we'll be waiting for you for day four of Rust Lab tomorrow, which consists of a three hour workshop by Luca Barbeto uh, called for, From C to Rust and Back, the tutorial. So I uh, hope to see you all there and uh, have a great rest of your day. See you next time. Bye-bye.